Hey everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanics.com. Today, we're talking about the top five failures of the Mark IV Golf Beetle and Jetta. All right, last week I did a show about the top five failures of the B6 Passat, and you guys absolutely loved the show. The feedback was great, so I figured I'd go ahead and do the Mark IV Golf Beetle and Jetta. Now, this is probably not going to be a show that I'm going to do all the time because you're actually going to see really common failures across the entire brand, but it's a nice little break and a change of pace from a failed parts video. And you notice that I said Golf Beetle and Jetta. That's because those cars are all on the same platform. They basically share the same failures. They have the same engine transmission combinations for the most part in that generation. So we kind of lump all of those together. All right, before we get into the show, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is Deutsche Auto Parts. These guys are the Volkswagen Audi parts experts. Awesome service, incredible pricing, a ton of really great DIYs. Paul and the boys also do a really great Q&A show called Ask Dap. So hashtag Ask Dap on Instagram or Twitter and uh, ask Paul and the boys a question. They do a great, great job of answering your automotive and Volkswagen questions. So check them out at shopdap.com. All right, so this is going to be the 1998-ish to 2005-ish Golf Beetle and Jetta. The Golf, the Beetle, and the Jetta kind of start and finish in different years. So we're kind of taking 98 to 2005 and lumping it all together. I know some of the Golfs were 2006 and there wasn't a 1998 Jetta that was a Mark IV, but just roll with it. This is the Mark IV platform. All right, number one, window regulators. This was across the board on that, uh, on that generation vehicle. It didn't matter whether it was a two-door or four-door Golf, whether it was a Beetle, a Beetle convertible, or a Jetta. We used to replace window regulators like they were going out of style. A couple of things would happen. One, the clips that actually held the window glass in would crack and break. They were about half plastic with a little metal insert in them. And obviously the plastic would be the weak point. It would get hot, it would get cold, it would be subjected to moisture, and they would crack over time. Another thing that would happen is the regulator cable would get bound up inside the regulator and that would make it jumble all up. This big long cable would jumble all up and we would have to take the regulator carrier out and take all that mess of wiring and install either a new kit or an entire new regulator cable. It really depended on when this happened. Early on, there was a very big shortage of parts. Then for a point, you had to get the entire carrier, which meant you had to drill out the speaker and re-rivet it. And then they came out with these other crazy repair kits. So there's been four, five, six, seven different repairs over the years to get the best possible repair. I remember there was a time where I was doing two of these a day and that was not abnormal at all. You would do one side, replace the whole regulator or the whole you know cable kit. And then the other side you were supposed to check and possibly replace the clips that held the glass. So actually those were great times because I loved doing those window regulators. We don't see them too much anymore. We'll still see a beetle from time to time fail, but for the most part, I think we got them all actually fixed. There was even a warranty extension at one point on the failure of the clips. I think now we're way past any possibility of any of those cars being covered under warranty though. Number two, brake light switches. I feel like if you guys had a Mark IV, or you were a tech back when these were the really common vehicle, you're going through some nostalgia of laying up underneath the dash and jamming brake light switches in. There was a ton of revisions on the brake light switch. I think they started out with black brake light switches, then there was a recall and they were purple, and then that didn't really fix the problem at all. So there was a delay and then another recall and they were green and that was a completely different design and they were considerably better, but they also failed as well. Some of the symptoms were really interesting on a brake light failure. You could have either your brake lights didn't work or your brake lights never shut off. Maybe your car wouldn't come out of park. The brake light staying on would kill the battery. Your cruise control wouldn't work. Sometimes you'd get a fault for it, sometimes you wouldn't. It was, uh, it was really an interesting time on, on replacing all those brake light switches. I remember we used to have boxes and boxes and boxes of these brake light switches just piled up because we'd keep them all for some weird reason. It was really interesting, like the catastrophe that one of those simple little brake light switches could cause with a vehicle. Because think about it, your battery could be dead or you couldn't get your car out of park. That would result in a lot of times having to have the car towed to the dealership. So luckily there was multiple recalls on the brake light switch with the last generation or the last revision being a really interesting looking green brake light switch. Actually, funny enough, 
That style of brake light switch, the early one, followed into the Torag as well. There wasn't nearly the number of failures as there was on the Golf Beetle Jetta, but I have replaced that exact brake light switch on Torags as well. Number three, catalytic converters. All of the things that I've mentioned so far have either been under warranty extension or had recalls on them, and the catalytic converter was no different. They had an incredible warranty extension on a lot of those catalytic converters. Some were 10 years, 100,000 miles. Some were 10 years, 120,000 miles. It depended on what engine code you had in the car. But we would get customers come in with a check engine light on, pull the fault. It would be PO420, which is catalyst efficiency below threshold. We'd run the test, cat would fail. We were putting catalytic converters on cars left and right. And it didn't matter whether it was the 1.8 turbo, the 2 liter, all the variants of the 2 liter, even the VR6 had its fair share of failures of the catalytic converter. And it was a check engine light that would generally lead us down the path to replace the catalytic converter. There was also a number of software updates on different engines to overcome this catalyst efficiency below threshold fault. And we would even see them where they would get so bad that the catalyst inside would actually come apart and cause the car to rattle. This would really result in one heck of a rattle underneath the car. And it was a good thing for a lot of people that there was a warranty extension because those catalytic converters were like $1,200 to $1,500. I think they've come down in price a little bit, but that was not a cheap repair. And we also found that aftermarket catalytic converters were either welded in really poorly or wouldn't be efficient enough to make the ECM happy so the light would come back on anyway with an aftermarket cat. Then you would have to replace it with a factory cat and pay the core charge, so the price of the cat went up like 200 bucks. It gets crazy when we have to deal with an aftermarket catalytic converter on a car. Number four, engine coolant temperature sensors. I call it an ECT. A lot of people call it a CTS, coolant temp sensor. Call it what you want. Those things would fail all the time. It would get to the point when a check engine light was on, you know, we'd pull the faults, you'd get an open circuit or a short to B plus fault for the coolant temperature sensor, and the diagnosis would really be open the hood, look at it, see that it was the old revision, the older revisions were black in color, the newer revisions were green in color. Basically, if it wasn't a green one, that was the first step. No more diagnosis until you got a known good ECT. That's the rate that those black ECTs would fail at. And that could cause any number of things. Obviously, a check engine light. You could have issues with the gauge and the instrument cluster dropping out. I actually did a video about how those exact ECTs fail. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can check it out. It has a really cool thumbnail, I think. It's probably one of my most favorite thumbnails of any video that I've ever done. But check engine light, no gauge working or intermittent gauge dropouts. It could actually cause a no start or an extended crank because it would whack out the ECM as far as temperature goes and that would change all the fuel strategy for starting. I've seen it cause misfires. I've seen this ECT, the coolant temp sensor, basically cause just about any kind of drivability concern you could muster up. So luckily that's one thing that Volkswagen has seemed to move past as failing coolant temp sensors, but there was a long time where we were putting a lot of coolant temp sensors in cars. And number five, suspension bushings. The Mark IVs were known for wearing out front suspension bushings. The bushings at the tops of the struts, the bushings for the sway bar, the bushings for the control arms. Over time, the bushings would get weaker and weaker and weaker. They would start to collapse. They would cause too much play in the suspension, either travel up and down. You know, if it's the sway bar, they would a lot of times squeak when you're going around corners because the wheels would be doing this. They would even clunk while you go around corners. Neither one of those really resulted in much of a safety concern, other than the one time I seen a strut bushing fail so bad it actually popped through the cowl trim, which was really an interesting thing to look at on a Beetle. Really the big concern for me though, out of all those bushings was failure of the control arm bushings. Oddly enough, it wasn't just a Mark IV issue because my GTI, which is a Mark III, has a bad control arm bushing. And what would happen is the rubber would just break away from the mount and it would cause the entire control arm to shift. So every time you hit the brake, the whole front of the car would snap forward. Every time you hit the gas, it would snap and will cause a lot of clunking in the front end. I've replaced a countless number of strut bushings, sway bar bushings, and control arm bushings. So there you have it. Those are the top five failures on Mark IV, Golf, Beetle, and Jetta. Don't worry, there was plenty of other things that went wrong with those cars. Water pumps, cooling fans, rear brakes wearing out fast, tie rod ends, axle boots, series resistors in the blower motors, light bulbs, door latches. I could probably go on for like an hour and a half. 
After I did that B6 Passat video, I thought of like 10 more things that I could have added. But I'm gonna wrap it up there. I think that's enough bashing on the Mark IV. To be fair, I absolutely do love the Mark IV generation. So like any other car, there's a lot of things that commonly fail when you take a seven year span, three vehicles, a bunch of different engine and transmission combinations. It's really easy to pick out five to 10 really common failures. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you guys have any questions or comments, post it in the comments section below. Hey, if you like this video, make sure you let me know and I'll keep doing these. Uh, like I said before, I'm not gonna do them every week. I wanna try and space them out just a little bit, but I think this is a fun show to do. It's pretty nostalgic for me to remember like, oh man, we used to do all these really awesome window regulators, or man, do you remember back when the ECTs failed all the time? So throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously here on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Beer of the day. I'm so excited about this beer of the day. I actually posted a picture of this on Instagram yesterday, so make sure you follow me on Instagram. But this is Honor System IPA from Finches in Chicago, which I grew up just outside of Chicago. And it was actually a collaboration beer with a local beer store that my wife used to work at. So it's got this really cool militant beaver on the can. It's a rye IPA, and uh, I gotta say, really fantastic. So uh, nice job, Ted.